Good afternoon, everybody. This is Steve Orleans, president of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and I'm thrilled today to be joined by one of our directors, uh, Evan Medeiros. Those of you who know, who think about U.S.-China relations already know Evan. Today, his full title, it's quite a long title, is the Penner Family Chair in Asian Studies and the Kling Family Senior Fellow in U.S.-China Relations at Georgetown University. Prior to that, as all of you know, he was in the Obama administration for six years at the National Security Council, uh, culminating in his role as senior director uh, for East Asia in the National Security Council, which is the most senior uh, job in the administration uh, on a, in the National Security Council on Asia. The reason for today's talk is he has written uh, an article in Foreign Affairs put out by the Council on Foreign Relations called Major Power Rivalry in East Asia, which deals with the U.S.-China relationship, kind of where it is, where it's going, and then has very specific uh, recommendations as to what the United States should do uh, in terms of the relationship. I think it's critical at this juncture in the relationship, at this time in the relationship, that this be read. I think the audience probably has a pretty good idea, but why this article and why now? And how did it actually come about? Well, first, Steve, thanks for having me. And I appreciate you um, arranging this conversation in order to highlight the, the monograph that I just finished for CFR. And I want to begin, Steve, by thanking you uh, for your leadership of the National Committee. As you said, I'm one of the um, directors on the board. I've been there for almost six years now. And it's just remarkable to have a president like you in terms of the ability to resource the organization, lead it through a very difficult year, and the programming that the National Committee has been doing both online and offline, but of course more online in the last 12, 12 months has just been spectacular. And I think it is not only proof of your leadership, but also um, the demand for it is proof for how important the US-China relationship has become and how important it is for there to be serious fact-based analysis of what's going on in the US-China relationship. And I think the National Committee is able to do that both with the research we uh, sponsor, the research we collaborate with, and then the research like this report that you highlight. So kudos to you, Steve, and, and thanks again for sponsoring today's conversation. Boy, John, boy, John. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the CFR report is an outgrowth of a broader global initiative led by the, the Preventive Defense Project at the Council on Foreign Relations led by Paul Stairs. So my, my report is on East Asia, but there also, there are equivalent reports on uh, you know, South Asia, the Middle East, other regions. And the whole idea is to look at the risks of conflict and what are the sources of them? What are the probabilities? How might they manifest? And most importantly, what can be done to prevent them? And so um, Paul came to me and said, Evan, uh, how should we be thinking about the risk of conflict and confrontation in East Asia? And of course, the US-China relationship is at the center of that. Um, and he said, lay out for the readers uh, how we should be thinking about this risk of conflict and confrontation. Um, and I think that I found that to be a particularly intriguing task because there's had been so much conversation in the US-China relationship in the past few years about economic competition and technology competition um, that I think that, um, some analysts forgot that there are some very credible, very risky scenarios at the heart of the relationship that could lead us advertently, deliberately or inadvertently uh, into a situation of uh, actual confrontation. And so I found the, the report a fresh opportunity uh, to, to basically take a look at what are the risks of arms conflict? Um, how should we think about them systematically? Uh, and what does the United States, you know, a new Biden administration need to do to avoid them? We started this in the late, uh, late summer of 2020. Wow. Um, you know, and the original report was almost twice as long. Um, so it went through lots of iterations and the feedback I got from Paul and colleagues 
was just superb in really focusing it, right? It, it's, you know, as, as these reports go, it's only about 8,000 words, uh, which is actually a fairly limited amount of space given uh, the scope of the topic. So let, let me go through some of the things in the report in the order that they came Please. up in the report. Very early on, you talk about uh, the tension between catastrophic conflict and economic interests. That's actually on page two. Talk about what you mean there. Sure. So I think that the US-China relationship is emblematic of a broader phenomena occurring in global politics, which is we're seeing an intensification of both economic interdependence and security competition globally. And uh, simply the fact that China is the second largest economy in the world, it has a massive global economic footprint, right? It's the top trading partner with over 100 economies globally, um, means that the tension between security competition and economic interdependence um, is something, is a challenge that most policymakers face. And I think that's particularly acute for the United States because China is one of our top trading partners, depending on which year you look at. Um, you know, of course, the, the investment relationship is substantial and the financial market relationship, capital market relationship, as you know, uh, is growing by leaps and bounds. So there's no dearth of economic interdependence. But when I look at the security competition side of the equation, what we have is we have a relationship in which um, the competition is intensifying and diversifying. Um, I see the opportunities um, for you know, scenarios where there could be deliberate or inadvertent escalation to be substantial, Taiwan, South China Sea, East China Sea, and North Korea. Um, you have the competition become increasingly ideological. Uh, domestic politics are playing a greater role in the conflict. And then you have both sides beginning to sort of take risks and probing the limits of the other. So I see a, a convergence of a variety of factors that are bringing to head this tension between economic interdependence and the risk of confrontation. But doesn't economic interdependence lower the risk? Uh, it affects the risk. So if you were to ask historians of international relations, what historians would tell you was, no, that's not the case. The classic example is the degree of economic interdependence in Europe before World War I. Um, and it didn't forestall the outbreak of World War I. So, Look, looked at from both a, a historic and, and a theoretical perspective, um, economic interdependence is somewhat of a headwind to, it's a barrier to conflict and, and, and um, confrontation, but it certainly doesn't stop it. Yeah, I mean, you know, my view is, is very much that, that, especially investment flows, you know, trade, is one thing, but you have to distinguish between the kinds of economic interdependence. That investment interdependence is, is really creates people-to-people -people bonds and economic bonds that actually uh, prevent conflict. So uh, the natural question to, to ask then, Steve, because I agree with you, investment interdependence is different than trade. So why is it that as China has both accepted more international investment, and invested more abroad, right? It's ODI is through the roof. The Chinese talk even more about conflict over Taiwan. What, why do you, you know, why do we think um, it hasn't dampened any of China's incentives to think about war over Taiwan? And in fact, in recent weeks, you know, we've only seen military operations uh, in and around Taiwan by China increase. So I, you know, I think there are real questions about the 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 um, degree. Well, I, to I think the Chinese and, answer to that is is that uh, actions by the government on Taiwan and the United States have heightened concerns that we're moving towards an official relationship with uh, Taiwan, and that was fundamental to kind of the Chinese view that they would only use peaceful means to to advocate for reunification. That each sure. time. Uh, each time we cut that salami further, closer to the bone, the Chinese respond with military actions that you can chart the, the flights 
into China, into Taiwan's ABIZ, the flights to the midline to actions, especially less so now, but especially during the final days of the Trump administration, you know, the right. Secretary of State throwing out rules which you and I live by and sure. live by without a lot of trouble. Right. I, I, I agree with your assessment, but it still begs the question, Steve, um, you know, if economic interdependence, like you say, is such a bulwark against armed conflict, why are the Chinese going to be willing to consider using force against Taiwan as their economic interdependence grows. And you know, as I said, history in theory would suggest it's not as great a barrier to using force as some might think. Yeah, I, you know, again, it, it's not obviously one would agree it's not a it's not a total barrier. You know, it, it's obviously, you know, it's it doesn't totally block it, but it certainly inhibits the uh, sure. possibility of, uh, of conflict. So, yeah, it. Um, you know, the, the report later on talks about the shift from uh, the, 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 the view of U.S. China relations. And I love the way it's phrased is a shift from balancing cooperation and competition to competition and confrontation. So it's right. kind of it's it's moved. It's probably the right analysis. Is that good? Should we be working to prevent that from being kind of the modus operandi of US-China relations? I mean, yes, I think we should. I mean, confrontation and conflict is not good for anybody, especially the United States. So of course we should. That statement was about, uh, in the report, was, a, was regarding my assessment of what's happening in the US-China relationship. You know, I make three claims about shifts in the US-China relationship. Um, I talk about shifts in dynamics, I talk about shifts in politics, and then I, I talk about shifts in frameworks from cooperation and competition to competition and confrontation. But so that's an analytics assessment on my part. And I'm sure there are people that both agree and disagree with that assessment. You know, my point in making that assessment is I think that there's, an, there's enough voices um, in policymaking circles, both in the Congress and in the executive branch, that see the relationship tending toward competition, that sort of the center of gravity of, about American policy debates ha has changed. So, so I think that's the right assessment. Um, the real question is sort of what do you do about it? And the whole reason the report was written was to talk about what are the ways that you can compete in way in in ways that protect American economic and security interests, but also prevent the drift from competition into confrontation, right? That, that's sort of the one of the central premises of the report that we, we have to put speed bumps or roadblocks on that the road from competition to confrontation. Does that become a self-fulfilling prophecy though, if that's the way you characterize? the relationship that it's basically a competition potentially shifting to a confrontation rather than the way it was much more during the Obama administration. There is competition, but we should really be focusing on cooperation. The one thing that bothers me about the report is we've had enormous successes in cooperating with the Chinese and there's an underselling of that in in kind of this framing that it's 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 from a you know it's 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 confrontation or at best it's competition i you know iran we're trying to renegotiate the iran uh deal you know obviously secretary former secretary kerry is there talking sure. about climate change there's you know we've got to cooperate on uh, on vaccine distribution, we've got to cooperate on science, we've got to cooperate on new cancer drugs. I mean, I can give you a list of 25 things where we should focus on those. And in a way it becomes self-fulfilling that the relationship becomes more cooperative because you talk about it. Yeah. So I think that's exactly the right question, Steve. Um, I don't believe that there are ironclad laws of physics that apply to international relations. Right, I think um, you know agency on the part of governments, on the part of individual leaders, matters enormously. 
So I don't think it's a self-fulfilling prophecy just because you adopt a competitive approach that that leads inevitably to confrontation. The question is really, how, or how do you compete? How do you structure your competitive approach in a way that protects your economic your, and your security interests, but on the other hand, doesn't make conflict and confrontation inevitable? Um, and that's a different article that I wrote that was in fact published in Foreign Affairs <laughs> a few weeks before this one. So, you know, uh, I'll send you a link to that one, Steve, and we can talk about what the appropriate policies are. But you raise the critical question, right? Is, you know, as we um, find ourselves in this world of strategic competition, and as the US under the Biden administration uh, thinks about what it means to compete with China, right? Tries to put together its, you know, policy of uh, competition, you know, Biden even called it extreme competition. What is the role of, of cooperation? And I agree, cooperation has an important role to play. What I tried to assess in the report was what is the likelihood of eliciting cooperation from China? And if in fact we do elicit cooperation from China, what is the probability that that cooperation will be able to balance out all the other areas of competition? And, you know, what I argued in the report was the track record of US-China cooperation is at best modest. Um, and even if we were able to elicit again, that same past modest level of cooperation, uh, I don't think it would, would have a tremendously stabilizing or really salutary effect on competition because I see uh, competition intensifying and diversifying, which I think is sort of section two, you know, of the entire report. So, and, and I think that I see this as a very active conversation. So if you want to go into detail on any of the case studies, you know, of cooperation you mentioned, I'm happy to do that. As you know, I was at the White House for a few of those. So I know them in detail. But I think that, that um, you know, the question really comes down to what the relationship between co cooperation and competition is um, and the extent to which that will um, stabilize or not the US-China relationship. In the 45 years I've dealt with the Chinese government um, to kind of talk, even when you disagree, to talk about things cooperatively um, is a way to get better results. You know, in uh, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I don't think the maybe you're being modest, but I, I don't think the the results of cooperation with China are as meager as you do. I think that the signing of the Paris Accords by the guy you work for, Obama, and President Xi was a was a big deal. It was a big deal. That's the existential threat that we are confronting now and that you guys were able to get work with the Chinese to get that done was a big deal. The Iran deal was a big deal. Certain actions that we did um, with China, things where China cooperated with us on the Security Council were, were, were that was that was good. Um, they were economic issues. You know, again, this goes back to pre, this goes back to W, but Certainly discussions we had that Secretary Paulson had, you know, about China's current account surplus. I mean, you worked for, for him way back when, um, and that that got reduced. How the Chinese, uh, you know, initially were tied totally to the dollar and had a, 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 you know, a currency which just created current account surplus and they ultimately uh, valued it properly, which was partly, I mean, a, brought about by US China cooperation in a different environment. Um, and sure. I can go on to other, uh, those, yeah, are, so why those, don't are material, those are material. Um, sure. Yeah, so what I think, let's talk about some of those for a second, Steve, because I think that it's important. Um, point number one is that it's important when we, when we talk about uh, this issue of cooperation to distinguish dialogue and cooperation because they're very, very different things, right? And I completely agree with you, dialogue at multiple levels uh, of government 
across societies is important. And I think it's one of the dimensions of the relationship that have atrophied to our substantial detriment most under both the Trump administration and of course under COVID because nobody's traveling anywhere. So it's important to distinguish dialogue as something that needs to be invested more in. I talk about that in, uh, in the paper and we need to make sure that we understand each other's perspective even if we don't understand it. We should use a variety of different dialogues um, to avoid the kind of misperception that leads to miscalculation. So, you know, dialogue is separate that needs to and should, should continue. And I, I hope the Biden administration gradually judiciously builds that out. Cooperation is something different, right? Cooperation is just sort of a higher level of interaction. And when you look at many of the traditional examples of cooperation, I think that um, what counts as cooperation is less often cooperation and more a series of parallel actions on both, of both sides. So there are a few different areas that, that are often talked about as generating cooperation, right? So nonproliferation, you talked about the Iran nuclear deal. I was in the Obama administration when the you know, JCPOA uh, you know, was worked on, et cetera. China was at the table, but China didn't play a great role. China actually played the, the least significant role of all the you know, P5 plus one members. And to the extent that we ever talked with the Chinese about Iran, uh, it was largely about um, reminding them of their JCPOA commitments not to illicitly buy Iranian oil. And you know, there were regular problems with that. So I don't think of, and I think that if you talk to Jake Sullivan or Bill Burns, they would agree with me, that the Chinese really played a major role in Iran. So the question becomes, is cooperation from China, China just not being a spoiler, not standing in the way of the agreement going forward? I mean, that doesn't feel like a particularly, you know, a, a particular strength of the US-China relationship if China is just not standing in the way. Uh, to North Korea, right? I mean, you know, on the North Korea issue, I think there's a genuine question about how co-op cooperative China has been over time. Um, China, you know, to their credit, convened the six party process. But if you talk to many Bush administration officials, and as you know, I have several of them as my colleagues at Georgetown, we've had several conversations about this. You know, the Chinese in the six party process largely played the part of neutral arbiter. Uh, in other words, they sort of felt like they were neither on the American side or North Korea side, but they often watered down American efforts to put pressure on North Korea. You know, and then ultimately, of course, uh, North Korea pulls out of the six party process. It ultimately collapses and most of the Obama administration is spent just trying to prevent the North Korea issue from getting better. So it's not really clear that China was ter terribly cooperative on North what Korea. About the, what about the increasing sanctions that they agreed to at the, at the UN Security so Council? So China did, That right. was active cooperation for some, you know, if they North Koreans were not our ally, they were the Chinese, sure. but they agreed so, to these increasing sanctions. Is that not a form of cooperation? But we is. don't, we will run out of time. If, but I mean, I see your point in what constitutes it's cooperation. Co what constitutes did, cooperation? Did, did, well, what's uh, the quality fighting. of the cooperation? And can you use that cooperation as a, as a basis for a strategic relationship? And my point is sort of when you look at the details, it's the cooperation when it exists, it's modest, it's often uh, time bound. It Ebola? takes a lot of US effort to get it. Um, you know, Ebola. in other words, the cooperative story. Ebola? What, what about Ebola? Ebola was good, no question. I, I, don't, I don't deny that the Chinese were cooperative on Ebola. I was there in 2014, part of the team that negotiated the deal. My point is not to say that there is no cooperation, Steve. It's just at the same time that the Chinese were helping on Ebola and they were helping on climate, they were also building seven, seven quasi-military bases in the South China Sea. So when we're talking about what are the different structures in the relationship that might prevent the drift from cooperation into confrontation, cooperation is important, but it clearly is not playing that, that, that buffer or stabilizer role. That's my point. Yeah. Um, we're going to run out of time, but just yeah. a couple of, a couple of um, you have a great, interesting kind of few paragraphs on North Korean and, and um, 
you know, what happens if the government in uh, North Korea collapses that you could potentially, because the Chinese would look to kind of control it, the South Koreans and we would kind of look to control it and you'd have all these, what we call loose nukes, um, which would need to be secured. Isn't that something where we need to cooperate with the Chinese? A absolutely. We need, we need to kind of have some rules if that should happen. I don't think it's inconceivable. Um, it's certainly something which we need to plan for, but isn't that something which dictates a more cooperative relationship with the Chinese? You're absolutely right. And Steve, it highlights two critical points. Number one, the fact that some of these confrontation scenarios are as much about um, inadvertent and accidental confrontation as deliberate confrontation. Um, the second point is during the entire Obama administration, we tried multiple times from multiple different angles to sit down and talk with the MFA and the PLA and ideally both of them together to talk about Korea scenarios. And they were simply unwilling to do it. Hmm. Um, my view was that they were unwilling to do it because they thought that by talking about it, they would be sort of unwit unwill unwittingly uh, sort of validating it and encouraging it or worst case it could leak and it would freak the North Koreans out. So look, the U.S. has tried for almost decades now to have this conversation with the Chinese, and they're simply unwilling to do it. And I think that that's, you know, that's unfortunate. Uh, I'd be surprised if the Chinese are willing to do it now, given the 2018 rapprochement between China and North Korea. Um, but look, maybe this is an area where the National Committee, you know, you and I are part of a variety of different high-level security dialogues. Uh, this is something that we can raise to see if perhaps a newly capable PLA that is now even more firmly under the control of Xi Jinping is willing to do it. Yeah. And whether what, what often, you know, the U.S.-China relationship obviously has reached new lows. Um, and is it possible that because of that, we'll see a, you know, and because of the Trump years, the one benefit will be we'll see a more uh, a MFA or a PLA that's more willing to discuss these kinds of issues. Last, quick, well, I'll ask for your recommendations is the final question, but the, the second from final question, the penultimate question is, you talk about China's military modernization starting in the 90s. Um, you talk about Japan's nationalization of part of the Sinkakus. Uh, you talk about what's gone on in the, in the South China Sea. And I think you correctly point out that, well, you don't talk about why the military modernization started in the 90s, but, but uh, a lot of it is reactions to what happens outside of China. Do you think the greatest risk is we do something which just creates uh, a reaction, in, an overreaction in China? In other words, what seems to me is going on, it's action, overreaction, another action, even a greater overreaction. Yeah, so the report, Steve, doesn't look to assign blame and say whose fault it is that we have problems in the South China Sea, East China Sea, Taiwan, or North Korea, right? I mean, the U.S.-China relationship has always been a, a, a active bilateral relationship in which there is action and reaction. So um, that is not to say that there is moral equivalence between both sides. And I do think that there are times at which China took the opportunity of a misstep or a mistake by another country and sort of, you know, overdid it. I think the East China Sea is an example of that. Um, but I agree there is an interactive dynamic between the U.S. and China. That's one of the reasons why, you know, I talk about the intensifying um, competition combined with a newly capable China combined with domestic politics in both sides being in many ways this sort of gathering storm that could manifest in either advertent or inadvertent conflict. So for sure there's an interactive dynamic, but um, you know that doesn't deny the reality that the pathways to conflict and the probability of those pathways coming about is growing. I have not been able to get to one half of my questions, but there's it just should give you, it should whet your appetite to to read this report. It's absolutely, for those interested in US-China relations, it's absolutely a, a must read. So let me conclude with one form, 
final question, which is again part of the report, but I think it's worth repeating in this in this um, this conversation, which is talk about it has great specificity in the recommendations, and even if one doesn't totally agree with the analysis, it is impossible to disagree with the recommendations. So just give us a nutshell of what those recommendations are. Sure, there's two baskets of recommendation. Basket one is what the United States um, uh, should do in East Asia regarding military capabilities. And the short answer to the question is revitalize alliances and update US force posture in the region. Because I think reinforcing deterrence, not in a way that provokes conflict, but both reassures allies and deters potential adversaries is important. Basket number two is about what should happen in the bilateral relationship. And there's really three things there. First, I think we should restart high level dialogues to make sure that there's clear, consistent, credible communication. Um, but I also think that we should stop short of establishing the kind of highly formalized mechanisms that existed in the past. I think number two, that the US military in particular should explore ways to improve the functioning of some of the current constellation of crisis communication mechanisms, as well as some of the confidence building mechanisms that, that exist. They haven't performed well in recent years, and we certainly don't want to invest in underperforming assets, but it's also possible that the PLA, especially now, um, is going to be uh, more willing to utilize uh, what have been underperforming mechanisms. And I think lastly, the US should explore, not necessarily commit to more meaningful areas of cooperation with China, with China but be mindful of some of the, the, the sort of past limitations. You know, to your point, Steve, where, where our interests intersect, whether it's on things like um, global health, uh, course climate change, um, you know, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. The, the U.S. and China, you know, need to be working together. And this is this is not an argument just about the U.S.-China relationship, because as as I said, I'm very uh, careful about whether or not I think cooperation is sort of the the save all for the relationship. But rather, I think we need this cooperation for the purposes of global governance. In other words, you can't make meaningful. Uh, progress on issues globally or even in Asia without two major players with the United States working together. So I think that that uh, pursuing that cooperative agenda is good for the sake of global governance. The last and final point I'll end on is too often cooperation is um, sort of contrasted with competition. And I think what's often forgotten is America's ability to compete with China and really have a smart competitive strategy requires us to be able to cooperate. In other words, cooperation and engagement supercharges our ability to compete because I think it signals China that we're not interested in regime change or to overthrow them. And it also signals to our allies and partners that we're gonna pursue competition in a, a rational way, you know, not in a way that could lead them and drag them into confrontation. So cooperation really supercharging competition in a way that allows it to be sustained over time. But the report, so with that, many thanks to you. The report gives short trip though to the possibility of, of a new grand bargain with, with China. That's Just right. describe that and then I'll sign us off. Yeah, so I, I, I think there's very little evidence of grand bargains working in international relations aside from the US-China relationship. And because American and Chinese interests and values are so different right now, it's very hard for me to understand what the contours of that grand bargain would be, whether it's the sort of big grand bargain, Potsdam and Yalta, or even a small grand bargain, a sort of rules of the road for how to interact. I think we're, we're, um, we're far from that. And I think trying to convince ourselves that that kind of big or small grand bargain would work would only accentuate um, the risks of misperception and misunderstanding that could allow uh, the competitive dimensions of the relationship to evolve into confrontational ones. This was intended to whet your appetite to read the report. The, the link is posted. Um, I, if you're interested in US-China relations, it's a must read. It's also kind of reminded us why Evan is one of America's 
great experts on U.S.-China relations. We're happy he served. We are happy he is part of the National Committee and happy that he remains incredibly engaged in the U.S.-China relationship. But Evan, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. Thank you for writing this important piece.